Hi, I'm Adele Ferris. I flew in today to talk to Wally Bevan, the Southern Region's Airworthiness Safety Program Manager. We're here today to talk about the modifications aircraft owners make on their aircraft without thinking about the effects it may have on the safety of their aircraft. Let's go in and meet Wally. Wally! Hey, Dale, how you doing? Hi, good, good to see you. Good to see you too. How's your flight? Oh, it was a great flight, perfect weather. Great. So what exactly are we going to be talking about today, Wally? Well, Dale, we're going to be talking about regulatory requirements that an aircraft has to go through before it can receive a type certificate. And then we're going to talk about data sheets. And data sheets are part of this type certificate. What we want to do is we want to try to show people that they can't arbitrarily change design standards to an aircraft and modify it any way they want to. If they're going to do this, they're going to have to use some kind of approved data, FAA approved data. So we'll go over some of those examples too. Well, let's talk about modification. Well, what does modification mean to you? It means to change something. Well, let's see what Webster says about modification. Webster said modification is the making of a limited change in something. Well, you know, the FAA has got a term for everything, so we're not going to use modification. We're going to change it to alteration. And the definition of alteration is the result of altering or a modification. So let's look what Federal Aviation Regulation 1 says about major alterations. A major alteration means an alteration not listed in the aircraft, aircraft engine, or propeller specifications. These are like the data sheets that we're going to talk about. That might appreciably affect weight, balance, structural strength, performance, power plant operation, flight characteristics, or other qualities affecting airworthiness appreciable effect. That's something that's capable of being perceived or measured. As you can see, though, that is something that could be very minute, but it, as long as it's being capable of being perceived or measured, it's appreciable effect. Other qualities affecting airworthiness. It could be a malfunction due to an improper alteration, could be effects on continued safe flight, or could be something that jeopardizes the safety of the aircraft. The second part of that definition is that is not done according to accepted practices or cannot be done by elementary operations. Accepted practices could be those practices and methods acceptable to the administrator, which would be the FAA. It may be found in advisory circulars, manufacturer's maintenance manuals, military tech orders, and other specifications. Elementary operations, what we're talking about is something simple like putting a window in an aircraft that is not pressurized, that'd be considered elementary operation, something very simple. We need to talk about part 43, and that governs the rules for maintenance. 4313 says that each person performing maintenance or alterations, because that's what we're going to be talking about, or preventative maintenance on aircraft, engine, propellers, or appliance, shall use the method, techniques, and practices prescribed in the current manufacturer's maintenance manual or instruction for continued airworthiness prepared by its manufacturer or other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. Well, Dale, you look a little thirsty. That was a long flight. How about if we come get you a cup of coffee? That sounds great. Well, let's go. Okay. Dale, as a general aviation pilot, which federal aviation regulation rule do you operate your aircraft under? Part 91. Very good. Let's take a look at Part 91 and see what it says about civil aircraft airworthiness. 91.7 says, no person may operate a civil aircraft unless it is in airworthy condition. What does airworthy mean to you? Uh, that my aircraft is safe for flying. That's great. If you notice, when we talked about definitions, I didn't mention the definition of airworthy because it's not found in FAR Part 1. It's found on your standard airworthiness certificate that you have in your aircraft. I have a copy of that airworthiness certificate, so let's take a look at it and see what it says. If we we go under the authority and basis for issuance. It says that this airworthiness certificate is issued pursuant to the Federal Aviation Act of 1958 and certifies that as of the date of issuance, the aircraft to which issued has been, is has been inspected and found to conform to the type certificate, therefore being conditioned for safe operation. So we see there's two conditions that must be met. The first one, like you said, has to be conditioned for safe operation. And the second one is that it has to meet its type certificate. So those two things constitute the definition of the word airworthy. So let's move down a little bit further and see what else it says on this airworthiness certificate. It says, this airworthiness certificate is effective as long as the maintenance, preventative maintenance, and alterations are performed in accordance with parts 21, 43, and 91 of the Federal Aviation Regulations. We talked about part 91 being the Federal Aviation Regulation that you operate under. 
and you maintain your aircraft under. Part 43 were the rules that we talked about governing maintenance. It says you have to use a maintenance manual or instructions by the manufacturer whenever you work on anything or other methods and techniques acceptable to the administrator. Now let's talk about Part 21. That deals with type certificates and type design. FAR Part 21 contains the regulations and procedures for type certification, we just talked about, supplemental type certification, which are STCs, parts manufacturing approvals, PMAs, technical standard ordered authorization, with TSOs, and the issuance of airworthiness certificate, such as what we just looked at. The designation of applicable regulations is found in FAR 21.17. It says, except as provided in 23.2, which is your small aircraft regulations, 25.2, which are the certification requirements for large aircraft, 27.2, which is small rotorcraft, 29.2, which is large rotorcraft, and parts of 34 and 36, which are your engine and propeller chapters. An applicant must show that the product meets the applicable requirements of this, this subchapter that are effective on the date of the application for that certificate. So if they're building any of these small aircraft, small rotorcraft, large aircraft, they have to meet all the requirements that's effective on the date of the application of that certificate. What is a type certificate? It's a type certificate is a document issued by the FAA to an applicant who has proven that his or her aircraft, aircraft engine or propeller, meets all the applicable federal aviation regulations pertaining to that product. Type certificates include type design, operating limitations, data sheet, applicable regulations, and other conditions and limits. When we talk about type design, type design consists of the drawings, specs, design features, configuration, and other features covered in the requirements of the part applicable to the product. So if we were going to design an aircraft, a small aircraft, we will be designing it to the Federal Aviation Regulation Part 23 standards. Mm -hmm. So we would have to meet all those requirements in Part 23 to be able to get a type certificate for that aircraft. Now I had the opportunity, knowing you were coming over today, mm -hmm. to pull the type certificate on your aircraft. So let's go over and see what's on this type certificate. Dell, the first thing I want to show you on this is the applicability of this type certificate data sheet. If you notice right here was we're up to revision 42. Now they make revisions for over a period of time and we'll talk about this in a little bit. Now you have a PA 28161, is that right? Yes. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. I'm going to show you all the kind of information that comes on this type certificate data sheet right here. So let's look at your, your aircraft. The type of engine that you have on your aircraft is a Lycoming 0320 D3G and it has a carburetor setting on it. Well, this aircraft could have two different types of engines, so if you ever wanted to change it to a 0320 D2A, you'd be able to do that because it was designed with either one of those engines on it. The fuel, you have to use 100 octane, so you couldn't use 80. Wouldn't be legal. The engine limits, it has, for all operations, 2,700 RPM. The aircraft is rated at a 160 horsepower at that RPM. Now, the different types of propellers that you could put on this aircraft. You could put this Sensage prop on there, the 74DM6-60, or you could put the 74DM6-0-58. They could be two different types of props, one for climb, one for cruise. But this right here is your justification to be able to put them on there. You can switch these props, and this would be your approval. Now, when your aircraft goes in for an annual inspection, your mechanic has to run your aircraft up when he after he completes the annual inspection. That's a requirement of FAR 91. And this is where he gets that static run-up output right here, is off this type certificate data sheet right here. It says that for this prop right here, this propeller, the static RPM at maximum permissible throttle setting is not over 2430 RPM, but not under 2330. If it does not fall into the range with this propeller installed, then your aircraft's not airworthy. Because remember, it has to meet what do we say? Type design. Right. Right. So right down here, I just noticed under propeller, spinner assembly, look, it even talks about the pipe or part members for the spinners. You know, Wally, I've seen some aircraft like mine operate without the spinner installed. Is that legal? Well, let's see what note 11 says. It takes us over to a note. And it says that the PA 28161, and it gives a 
bunch of serial numbers that I'm sure yours falls within and up may be operated with a spinner dome removed or with a spinner dome and front and rear bulkheads removed. So yes, in that case, it would be legal. Down here we have the airspeed limits. Now your airspeed indicator has different markings on it. So if you were to get a replacement airspeed indicator and didn't have the markings, this would be a, a place that you could come also and look and find out where you would put your red line and, and the different uh, color codes for it. We have center of gravity range for when you have to do your weight and balance calculations. You've got your uh, empty CG range. You've got your maximum weight, the number of permissible seats. Let me give you an example. On your aircraft, it's four. I was out at a uh, air show one time, and I was looking up watching these parachutes open. I noticed there was a Cessna 172, which is a certificated as a four-place airplane. I saw four parachutes open. So I looked around, and I didn't see anybody operating a remote control flying this airplane. So I knew there had to be at least five people in that airplane. I waited till the airplane landed, and I asked the pilot if he knew how many people he was allowed to haul in this airplane. And he told me, well, I could haul four. I said, well, including yourself? He said, no, five. I said, no, you don't understand. This aircraft was only certificated for four people to be in it at one time. You had five. Regardless of whether you take the seats out or what you're using it for, this is what this data sheet tells us. That, and it's the same thing with your aircraft. Your aircraft was only certificated for four, so that's all you could put in there, no matter how many seat belts you would even put in there. So let's move on. Maximum baggage. Eligible for the normal category only, 200 pounds, and it gives the location. Fuel capacity, 50 gallons, and it also gives, says you have two wing tanks on there. Oil capacity is eight quarts. We'll get into later on on the engine type certificate as to what uh, type of oil you could put in there. Control surface movements. This would be important for your mechanic when he is rigging your aircraft so that he would know. We always want to use a manufacturer's maintenance manual. However, this thing is current, too. He could get the same information. Now, notice down here where it says manufacturer serial numbers. Mm. Right here, it says that these serial numbers right here is authorized. You can issue an airworthiness certificate for those block of serial numbers. I had an individual that bought a Piper Aztec down in South America, and he brought it back into the States and wanted me to issue an airworthiness certificate to it. Well, when I pulled this data sheet up, his serial number was not eligible to even have a U.S. airworthiness certificate, meaning that Piper had built these airplanes for nothing but export overseas, and they could not come back into the U.S. because they were not built to the same standard that, that our, these airplanes are. So there's a lot of good information on these sheets. Let's look through the certification basis. You have a PA-28-161. So your aircraft was certificated under the old Civil Aviation Regulation 3, and it goes into the effective dates. Now, you notice where it says right here that you have uh, Amendment 23-7, you have Part 23 or Federal Aviation 23-959 of this amendment. These are different requirements that are within Part 23 that you still have to meet on your aircraft. They may be placards, they may be fuel vents, something, but you've got to meet not only your Civil Aviation Regulation 3, but these additional new Federal Aviation Part 23 requirements. And it gives a lot of the different requirements for the other aircraft that are included in your data sheet here. Equipment. The basic required equipment as prescribed in the applicable airworthiness regulation must be installed in the aircraft for certification. Well, I know a pilot operating handbook is required for my aircraft. That's correct. If you look down here, it says, in addition, the following documents are required. and We locate your aircraft, PA-28-161. It says that you have to have a pilot operating handbook. It even gives you the report number and the date that it was approved. Now let's just say, for instance, that you lost your handbook. You would need to come back here and make sure which report number it was before you ordered it. You could not just get another PA-28-161. See, we have about six or seven different handbooks for that same model. You could not get that and just stick it in your aircraft. It has to be the, this report because that's where your serial number falls. Okay. So we get to the notes right here. Notice it says current weight and balance report, including list of equipment included in certification, empty weight, and loading instructions. When necessary, must be provided for each aircraft at the same time of original certification. 
The certificated empty weight and corresponding center of gravity location must include undrainable system oil and unusable fuel as noted below. And again, it gives it for your PA 28161 and the serial numbers. Note two is, is normally always placards. These are the uh, what you have on your dash and everything. Example would be this placard here that says this airplane must be operated as a normal category airplane in compliance with operating limitations state in the form of placards, markings, and manual. Do you have that placard in your aircraft? Yes. Good deal. Notice what it says right here. Reference the airplane flight manual for addition required placards. So if you went in the back of your pilot operating handbook and there was additional placards besides what's required right here, those would have to be installed. Say maximum baggage allowable 200 pounds and it says it's going to be back on the baggage deck. You would have to have that in there. These are all part of the certification requirements. You've got different notes and as we go through, let's look at, we looked at note 11 on the, uh, the spinner. Let's look at note 17 right here. It says the following serial number aircraft are not eligible for import certification to the U.S. That was just like the story I told. These are the serial numbers of the PA-28 that cannot come back into the States, cannot be issued there were than the certificates. Got a couple more things on this, and we'll go look at an engine uh, type certificate data sheet. Note 24, it says on models PA-28-161, it lists the serial number and up that wheel fairings, but not the landing gear strut fairings, may be removed. So if you're going in and out of that short strip that you and your friend have over there in Florida, and you want to pull those wheel pants off so that you don't tear them on that grass, this would be permissible. You could do that. You just could not pull the landing gear fairings off. So that's where that allows that. And also here on note 26, it says with the installation of Piper Kit 880-50, you can up the maximum gross weight of your aircraft. So if you install that, this would be now your normal category ramp, ramp takeoff weight would be 2332, your max weight. So there's a lot of good information on this data sheet that can help you. Now you can get this data sheet from your IA when you have your annual inspection done. Let's look at one of the engine type certificate data sheets. And they have a lot of good information on it. And I'll, I'll move through this because I know this is, this is really dry stuff. But this is stuff that you really should realize. This type certificate holder on this data sheet is Lycoming Division in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And you notice that, that this is for the 0320, D2A, and D3G, because those are the two types of engines that could be installed on your aircraft. Again, it's updated all the time. We're up to revision 14 already, and dated September 17, 1980. Keep those dates in mind, not these particular, but the revision dates, because it's going to come into play here shortly. Notice the fuel right here. You have to use 100 or 100 low lead in your aircraft. Most likely, we saw the same thing over here on the airframe type certificate data sheet. They got that information from Lycoming. The carburation, you have to use a Marvin Schreiber MA4 SPA. That's the type of carburetor that's on your aircraft. Or you could use one of these D1Ds, Marvin Schreiber HA6. That's indicating it's on a D1D engine. So if you had that, you would use that carburetor. The reason this is important is because you might get an airworthiness directive that comes down on this carburetor and it might say, do not fly your airplane until you do such and such, and you need to know what type of carburetor is on your airplane. So there's a lot of more information on this data sheet right here, such as the type of oil that you have to use. We have the compression. We have ignition right here, the type of magnetos that goes on your aircraft, what the certification basis was. This was the old Civil Aviation Regulation 13. We come over to the notes. Note one here, maximum permissible temperatures are as follows. Cylinder head temp is 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Cylinder barrel is 325 degrees Fahrenheit. And the oil inlet is 245 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this is where my mechanic would get his information about where to set the red line on my cylinder head temperature gauge. That's correct. That's great. There's a lot of more information as we go through this type certificate that I just want to point out a couple highlights. Note 4 right here, for your engine, it even tells you what kind of spark plugs that you can run into it. How many times have you known you or your friends, you go down to get spark plugs for your airplane, you depend upon the parts store to give you the correct spark plugs. But if you really want to know it, you should be looking in your type certificate data sheet 
or your manufacturer's maintenance manuals. Those are the only approved spark plugs that can be run in these engines. So I think I've given enough examples of the use of these type certificate data sheets. These are the way that these engines and airframes are designed. You're not allowed to change anything from these design standards. All this information has been already approved by FA Engineering, and so this is why we can't make any modifications or, in our new word, alterations to our aircraft. If we're going to do this, we have to have some kind of other approved data. So let's talk about approved data. Data used to approve major and minor alterations. Some of the type of approved data could be your type certificate data sheets. Remember when we went back and we said you could either have this engine or this engine installed? You could switch them. That would be approved data. You wouldn't have to have any other type of approval. Same thing with your propeller. Supplemental type certificates. You've heard STC. Whenever there's a major design change by somebody other than the manufacturer, then what they will have is an STC. They'll be issuing the STC, and that's a supplement to that original type certificate. Airworthiness directives. If an AD comes out and says that you have to change this part or you have to alter your airframe so that it is now safer, that would be your approved data, the basis for you to be able to make that alteration. Manufacturer's FA approved data, which could be minor design changes could come out in the way of service bulletins or major design changes could come out to a revision to this type certificate. Remember when I was saying keep that revision number and that date in mind? Each time that the manufacturer comes out with a revision, they update these data sheets. So they're constantly being updated. Designated engineering representatives, such as DERs, they can approve data, and it'll be identified on a FA Form 8110.3, which will be attap attached to your 337 form. Designated alteration stations, approved data developed for alterations performed by that, that station itself. You don't see a whole lot of those anymore. Now, can you think of anything that I've left out or missed in the way of approved data? Well, uh, I haven't heard you talk about field approvals. Very good. Let's talk about field approvals because this is what you're normally going to see out in the field. Now, the first thing I want to say about field approvals is when you go to your flight standards district office and you're wanting a field approval done on a major alteration that you've done to your aircraft, the inspector is going to get his handbook out and there's only a certain amount of things that we can field approve. We have to send a lot of our stuff through the aircraft certification office. So keep that in mind. But whatever you decide to do, work it through your local flight standards district office. If we have to go to the ACO or the aircraft certification office, we'll process that paperwork and work with you on that. So let's see what you have to do to get a field approval. Some of the procedures are that we're going to review the data that you submit to make sure that enough data is supplied and it's complete enough to proceed with the evaluation of your proposed alteration. The inspector must review and evaluate the following. A formal application submitted on one of the following, an FA Form 337 completed in duplicate, other administrative forms used by a manufacturer operator that are acceptable to the administrator. If you were an air carrier, then we would evaluate the forms that we approved under your air carrier certificate. Data that may include but is not limited to, we want to see a detailed description of the proposed alteration. I want to know the location. I might want to know the parts you're using, the materials. The more information you can give me on this, the better. We want to see detailed design standards such as methods, sketches, drawings, stress analysis, photographs, electrical load analysis. Like I said, the more information that you can give me, the better and easier it's going to be for either myself to evaluate it, if I'm going to do the field approval, or if we have to send it off to the ACO, the Aircraft Certification Office, to do the field approval. I want to see what your test procedures. Once I get it done, how's it going to affect different systems? Say it was an electrical. I want to see you, the test procedure that when I get done, I'm going to test it this way and it should work this way. These are the type of things that we're going to be looking for when you bring this information to us. And what will happen is if I can't do it because I'm prohibited by my handbook and I send it up to the aircraft certification office, they will authorize me to field approve that. So what will happen is I'll get a letter back and I'll call you up and say, Dell, we, I got the information back. I've got your 337 form. I'm going to sign it off in the field approval block. So that's how the field approval process works. Those are some of the examples of approved data. So hopefully, if you decide you want to make any alterations to your aircraft, you want to check with your mechanic 
or your flight standards district office, an airworthiness inspector. Get your, if your mechanic's going to do it for you, get them to draw up everything you want to do, and let's see if it affects safety so we can get some kind of FAA approval in the forms of what we've just talked about. How about let's go outside and, and look at a couple aircraft and see if we can identify any problems in those aircraft. Sounds good. Now that we've gone through this material, I'm beginning to understand why I can't alter my own aircraft. Well, Dale, you can alter your aircraft as long as you use one of the type of FAA-approved data that we talked about earlier. Remember, all data must be evaluated by FAA engineering to make sure that your aircraft meets the same level of safety as when it was first type certificated. Right. Let's take a look at our first example. Now, what do you see wrong with this spinner? Well, it looks good to me other than these two washers. That's very good. High performance aircraft use balanced spinners. Now, these washers might be part of the balance weights to keep this in balance. However, these holes might be elongated, at which point these washers are just filling in those holes so we can keep this spinner tight against the backing plate. It also might be detrimental to the balance of this spinner by putting these weights on there. It'd have an opposite effect and throw this spinner out of balance. By being out of balance, it would transmit that through your propeller where it's attached to the crankshaft and to your engine and might shorten your engine life. Wow. Let's take another look at an example. Dell, if you notice, this exhaust stack may have been altered by putting this extension on. And in this case, this thing has been crushed. What it's doing is push it, putting additional back pressure on the engine. Well, I can see that, but what does that mean to me as a pilot? Well, around sea level, probably not a whole lot. But when you get to high density altitude airports, such as that you find in Colorado, what this additional back pressure does is going to deteriorate the performance of your engine and may require a lot more power for takeoff. Well, I definitely want as much power as I can get when I take off. What else have you got? Well, come over here and let's see. Dell, I want to show you a major alteration that's been made to this aileron. You notice where somebody has taken a piece of sheet metal and have pop riveted to this aileron and made their own adjustable trim tab? Mm -hmm. Well, what we probably have here is an aircraft that's out of rig. Instead of going and washing the wings in and out to make this aircraft track straight through the air, or wing level instead of opposed to wing high or low, they've went and installed this on here. Well, Cessna, when they did the flight testing on the 150 and 172 series aircraft, they found out that these fixed trim tabs produce flutter on the aircraft, and they say by no means can we install these on here. So as you can see, we have something that affects the safety of this flight because we don't want to lose this aileron. Mm. Well, let me ask you something. I learned to fly in a Cessna 150, and I noticed that it didn't have a rudder trim tab, but this one does. What's its function? Well, the function of the rudder trim tab is to keep the aircraft flying straight through the air. Most likely, like we had with the aileron, we have a rigging problem. The cables get loose over a period of time, and the thing will not tra no longer track straight through the air. So what the mechanics will do is they'll get in there and they'll try to rig it in accordance with the maintenance manual. If it doesn't rig out, they'll put a trim tab on here so that it'll track straight through the air. Now, the Cessna 152s came with an adjustable rudder trim tab, but the Cessna 150s didn't. So if we want to install this on the Cessna 150, we have to go back and have some sort of approved data like we talked about earlier. That makes sense. Well, Wally, I think I've got the big picture. Why don't we walk over to my airplane? I've got a question I want to ask you. Sure. Let me go pick up my jacket and book, and I'll meet you in the hangar. Okay. You know, Wally, I've been thinking about installing some sheepskin seat covers into my aircraft, but since we've been talking, I'm having second thoughts. Hey, all right. Do you remember earlier today when we were looking at the data sheet on your aircraft? What was the certification basis? Car 3. Very good. Listen, I don't have a copy of Car 3 with me, but if you see your mechanic or your local flight standards district office and worth its inspector and go back into car three and find if there's any requirements for flammability of aircraft interiors. If there wasn't, then there won't be any problem installing them. Okay, I'll check with my mechanic. Well, I'm glad you come on over today and I hope you have a safe flight back home. Okay, thanks very much, Wally. Take care of yourself. I've just completed my pre-flight inspection. Always do a thorough pre-flight inspection before you go flying. The purpose of Wally's presentation is to get you thinking about the consequences you may be subjecting yourself and your aircraft to by making these alterations. If you are thinking about making any changes, 
please consult your mechanic or any flight standards airworthiness inspector before doing so. Think about safety and enjoy your flight.